Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 336, for Monday, February 7th, 2022. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Bandzoogle, where promo code GIGGAB gets you 15% off your first year. We'll talk about uh, the details and the hows and the whys and all that in a few minutes here, deeper in the show. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you today, Mr. Kent? I'm good, Dave. You know, a lot of things starting to go on. The year is... We're getting into the year and, and uh, opportunities starting to present itself. Yeah. I don't know if I told you, I... um. I think I told you once that when I moved down here, I had no interest in getting another band together, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Before I don't know if I laughed out loud when you said that, but I, I laughed quietly. Like, I, I know Paul. He's definitely going to want a new band. Like, it's how it's going to well, work. So when I, I said it at the time, I think what I also said was I have a band. Right? Well, that's fair. Sure. And, uh, you know, in my mind, it was like, you know, I'm going to have a nice, quiet little, you know, pick up acoustic gigs and, you know, maybe get a little bit of a following down here and, you know sort of replicate what I do up there. Sure. And then, you know, a, a fair amount of my life is dedicated. But, um, you know, the wind blows, right? And and uh, I'm watching... The House Rockers are in a good place. I was thinking about the thing that you said to me was like, man, your band has gone through replacing a drummer, now twice, replacing a bass player who was a founding member, and one of the drummers who we replaced was almost a founding member. Yeah. Uh, you know, a pandemic where we couldn't see each other for a year, the leader of the band moving 200 miles away. I mean, we've gone through a lot of stuff, and the band is good. You know, we've got a great schedule for this upcoming summer. We're going to play a lot. However, almost immediately upon me telling the guys that, you know, life is going to change instead of us playing every weekend – we're going to be kind of on a schedule and I'll block out these weeks and, you know, yeah. but I understand <laughs> they started filling that time as should be expected with other things. Some of them are, you know, sitting in on jams around town. A couple of them have started things and in that, which is kind of hard for me and I'm going to be a little, a little wimpy about this, but you know, it's a little hard to watch their hearts go to other projects where we were kind of all, all for one, one for all. I get it. I'm the one who made the change. Yep. I'm the one who moved. But it, you know, in my, I think my. Well, I, you you mind, don't have to apologize for that. I, I feel the same way in, in with any project I'm in. If I'm being perfectly honest, uh, I'm always in multiple projects, or at least most of the time I am. Right. And so, like, this is going to sound like cognitive dissonance here, but it's just emotion. It's how it works. Right. You know, I understand the logical issues, but. I always feel that little twinge of like, oh, like that person's doing another thing too. Like, but we do a thing together, you know, like, right. and it's completely like logically irrational for me to a be perhaps the first one that's doing multiple things. And then also feel this. I don't, I don't even know what the feeling is. It's not jealousy. It's not sadness. It's just, I don't know. It's it's, but it's some little twinge of something that's like, oh, like, you, we do a thing together. Why aren't you we doing that together? But it's like, well, Dave, but Dave, look at your laundry list of things. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I, I, I'm well aware of what's in the mirror doesn't change the way I feel. But maybe that's the right way to say it. So yeah. Well, I then even it. further along. So you know, as they started to, even though I'll feel that tinge, I want them to do well. I want them to be successful. Same, right? And so I have referred tons of gigs to these guys, stuff that I couldn't do anymore. I've, I've sure. referred out, offered my contacts, offered my booking list. You know, however I can help, right? However, I still wish that all these situations could be complementary to what the house rockers do. Like they could all kind of feed in to each other. I mean, even when I started my solo career, it was because one of the guys in my band went off to, to do some original music. And uh, I still was like, what, you know, why do you need to do that? We're busy. We're, you know, doing, and he's like, I know I need to, this is a creative side of me that I need to go pursue. Yeah. And, and so he did that. And I was like, well, all right, but you know, you going means now opportunities will come up and nine other guys won't be able to work, you know, because one important guy is, is not available. And he's like, well, you know, this is the way it is. All right, cool. Um, 
So I started doing solo things, but I don't do a solo thing where I don't say, here's what's going on with the house rockers. Come see me with the house rockers. They are, they are different parts of me, you know, layered together, right? And I would like it if the guys, as they're out doing things, you know, I, I still think that the big juice, I think I told you in the Steve Van Zandt autobiography, he says the biggest regret he has, the biggest professional mistake he did was walking away from the E Street Band. He said, you never fully leave your power base. That's what you're known for. That's what you're identified with. That's what gives juice, um, leverage, momentum to other things you may want to do. Once I think, you're, I think you're everybody has to take that. a shot now because not only did you <laughs> mention Bruce, which <laughs> happens, uh, but also th- that's, I believe, the third episode in a row that you've mentioned that very specific quote. Yeah. So clearly this has been weighing Damn. on your mind. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I just figured if, mind... if I didn't acknowledge it, someone out there would acknowledge yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah. let's just, let's just take the wind out of that particular sail. Enjoy your shot of whatever it is you're choosing to have at home and let's move on. Yeah. L'chaim, everybody. There you go. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, and in my mind's eye, because the house rockers are still a good thing, a, 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 you know, humbly a big thing. It gets calls for big gigs and, you know, better money all the time. And, you know, relative to the pool of other groups, you know, we're doing really well. It would be great if in their individual pursuits, they would continue to support that. Now, as I say that, here's the deal. I see that and I see the value in that. When one of my guys, it doesn't dawn on him that that's what, yeah, what would be beneficial. That's harder for me to. So you mean there's you know there's saying? there's another human out there that doesn't see things the logically way that you the the logical way that you see them. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah, I, exactly. I, I know I'm being snarky I, I about that. I don't understand it. Yeah, I know, right. I, and you don't understand it, right? Yeah, I no, don't get it. I was having this conversation, not about music, but with a, a friend recently, just a, an hour and a half ago, about how, you know, it's this frustrating thing, like trying to convince other people to see your logic. It should take two minutes. It should be totally fine. Never works Life out that way. Life would be so much easier. Wouldn't it? Better. Yeah, would it, better yeah but it would too. be, I don't know that it would be better. It would be easier in those scenarios for sure, but- it might get really boring if everybody just agreed with you all the time. But I'm always right, man. <laughs> well, same. I, yeah, I don't disagree. I mean, obviously. Yeah, that's how it is. So anyway, uh, it's not quite complimentary. And, and in, in as much as that has settled into me that House Rockers will continue on, you know, we'll continue to book. People like it. It's good. But now, you know, the Brotherhood has got, I'm not going to say it's it's fractured that would be too harsh but it's it's growing new personalities right and in the re- re- recognition realization of that i'm like well maybe i was being a little too stringent in my thinking when i said i don't need another band and so one of the places i played down here I said hey we you know we're starting a new program you know but we're not doing solos you know do you have a trio and so of course i said of course i have a trio and then i went out and put together a trio <laughs> so <laughs> Uh-huh. So, uh, opportunity you know, knocks. Super, super good drummer who actually is from the Bay Area, oh. Randy Musumuchi. He um, is a solo artist. He's uh, very experienced, and he happens to live down here. So we never had a chance to play or hang out much up there, but we had a lot of common friends who I think verified us both for each other. And so now I have a good singing drummer that I can start with. That's I great. found a, a, a bass player who, believe it or not, on Craigslist, and he came over and we jammed one day, and the three of us got together. And we're going to start with that and see where it goes. But it, it's so baby steps. I'm actually... The reason I bring it up in this episode is it's originally just a little backing group for some solo ta- winery tasting room type gigs. Sure. And then another opportunity where they kind of want to band the thing. And they called me because I do solo gigs there and same type of thing. Like as summer comes, we want like a little bit bigger sound and yeah. people may want to dance. And so the idea that it may keep going into something. That's cool. I, it is cool. I feel a little bit like I'm cheating on my wife, you know, but it's. Right. Uh, no, I get is, that. I get that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, when it, when it hits me that, you know, cheating kind of thing is when one band or gig or something causes me to have to say no to another. Like I, I hate, I hate saying no to gigs and, and part of it is of course just the FOMO, right? Like I, I, you know, but, and, and another part of it is 
you know, I know that if I say no too many times, I stop being the, the drummer in that project or certainly, you know, the first call drummer for a project if it's not a, you know, not a, a thing that plays all the time. Like, it, you know, it does it eventually causes a, a major issue. Right. You know, but I also don't like letting down my bandmates either. I, like there's a huge part of that where it's like, OK, you know, we, we all like to play. We all like to make money from gigs. And, you know, none of us wants to be the one that stops the others from being able to do that. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, so it's like it hurts on many levels when there is a scheduling conflict that that, you know, causes one of those scenarios. But so as the person who is a scheduler in all of my situations, yeah, you you know, what to. I can tell you is, well, I get to. But what I also do is I over communicate. Here's what you can expect. Sure. Here's the amount of time that I'm going to be allocating to this. So it's more not, it's not like you're sitting around waiting and, you know, this sharing of a calendar so people know exactly when I definitely won't be booking them because I'm, my body will be somewhere else uh, is interesting. But one of the things that I do make a commitment to is like for the house rockers, if I, if I book an acoustic gig and a house rocker opportunity comes up, even if it's better money for me to do the acoustic gig, I will do the house rockers. That is part of my commitment because you know, that's where my heart is. That's, and that's sure. You know, right. So that's uh, one way I show the guys that I'm fully committed. And, you know, it's one way that keeps, keep people, you know, belief is such an important thing. You know, you, people have, to, uh, musicians say a lot of things. Bookers say a lot of things. Being able to walk the walk is way better than talk the talk. And so I, I this is one of the ways that I try to walk the walk. That's and good. similarly to these new things I'm putting together down here, is here's what you can expect. You know, this expect one one a month, and then I'm committed. And if I can make that one a month happen, then you know, you guys up for doing a little bit more, and and you know, you kind of ease into those situations. You figure it out, making, yeah, without making big promises, yeah, right, yeah, I yeah. Will tell you, it's good. What, one one thing, to kind of transition here is. So I have I have many things you, that we're going to be transitioning to, and at some point I'll grab the reins and do that. But go ahead. All right. So um, I know that you got to know uh, Russ, who was the House Rockers drummer. Russ yeah. has stepped aside from the House Rockers for a number of reasons. Uh, the schedule. Yeah. Uh, he had recently retired from day job, and I know he had put off a couple of big trips with his wife, and uh, that yeah. was hard for him. His kids live in Southern California, and they just opened a restaurant, and he wants to be a, a little bit more of a part of that. So Russ, very, very professionally, you know, had a conversation with me and he, he stepped aside. Luckily for us, and I've shared this when we went through the bass player transition, uh, we had a guy who subbed for us who's a very well-known player, Don Frank, who you met. Oh, Simon. yeah. I, I sat in with uh, Simon's. John, Don was the one who very graciously invited me to sit in with Simon's acoustic band when I was out there in uh, in the fall. So, or yeah, in the summer, I guess, yeah. Don is, uh, he's a great drummer. He, you know, he's got a, a recording credit with the Doobie Brothers. He yeah. has, was with Ronnie Manchos for a while. I mean, he, he is the real deal. Yeah, I mean, he's, he a, is, he's a good drummer and, and I would say an even better human. And that's not to say anything derogatory about his drumming skills. He's just a good guy. Oh, I thought you were going to say he was a better human than Russ, which I would say. Oh, no, no, he's just a better human there. than he is a drummer, but and he's a yeah. fantastic drummer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's great. So, uh, anyway, so. Nice thing is to have a good circle of friends where when we have to make a change, we're going to do it the same way. We agreed, you know, let's call it a, a long-term sub for now. Yep. But I will have I, the, the transition I wanted to make is sometimes when you have to change a band member, the enthusiasm that someone can bring who really, really wants the opportunity is so infectious. It affects the whole band, even if it's a bunch of jaded old you know, uh, been together a long time. Oh no, it, we we're seeing that with Fling. I, I can That's tell what I'm you. Saying. Yeah, the yeah. Other, the other side of it with with Jamie having having come into Fling, it it's infused new energy into things. I mean, not only did he bring his own songs in that uh, that fit just like a glove into what Fling already has. Uh, he loves the songs that that Fling already has. Like he showed up for the second audition. And it was like, I, I noticed at one point, I'm like, dude, you're not reading charts. Like we would just call a song. You'd be like, okay, like, how are you pulling these up quickly? He's like, ah, I memorized them all. Like, That's crazy. And he's like, that's easy when you like the songs. I was like, oh, that's an interesting point. I, he didn't know this necessarily, but by that point we were pretty sure we were going with him. 
And so I was like, oh, well, that, okay, great. So he's in like we are. This is good, you know, and it's been great. So, yes, I totally, totally get it. Yeah. New Blood is really cool. So New Blood is good. Yeah. And it, it, it's usually for the music. I mean, yeah. when, Ru when Russ came into the band, he took some of the songs that we've been playing for a while and they sounded totally new in Russ's hands and right. it was energizing to the band. And I'm sure it's going to be that way with Don. It's certainly that way with Chris Beveridge on bass. I mean, so yeah. where you get to that point right. where you're fortunate. I mean, you know, when you're starting out and you don't have a network, I, I think we talked about this. Often bands take just the first warm blooded person who can fog a mirror and all of a sudden let's make a band together. Is it the person you really want to live with for a long time? No. Do you learn to love them over time? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But the other side of it is when you've been around for a while and you, you have a good network and you can call on certain yeah. people yeah. when opportunities come out, it, life is so much better. And, and you know, like I said, Don is a total pro, great player, has demonstrated not you know, a total pro can often be a jaded total pro, right? Oh, sure. And, and oh, yeah. he might have fit even as a jaded total pro. I'm I'm almost as excited about his enthusiasm, you know, That's for great. being a part of a group as I am for his chops. That's great. That's great. Yep. Oh, what do we I have? We have actually we have a, a, a little um, app to talk about later in the show that might solve one of the problems you've already mentioned in terms of scheduling your band. Uh, I learned some lessons at the gig I played this weekend, we'll say, because the lessons sort of span the weekend, not just uh, the gig that happened to be yesterday. And then the next thing I want to do is talk about our sponsor, Banzoogle. Banzoogle is where you are going to go to host your band's online presence, right? And, and the reason you're going to go to Banzoogle instead of perhaps anywhere else is that Banzoogle is built by musicians for musicians. It's Banzoogle is this all-in-one platform that makes it super easy for you to build your beautiful website, your electronic press kit, all the home online for your music that is yours, right? Like the, the, having your own web presence is huge. You want to be able to control your destiny. And that's what using bands will let you do. Cause in addition to what I just mentioned, or perhaps as part of that, they, they are your host. You can even use a custom domain name with them. They have dozens of fully customizable design templates. So you don't need to know how to write a web page. You go and use one of their templates that, as I said before, was built by musicians for musicians. So they know these aren't just generic templates that, are for, you know, website 101. These are templates that are very specifically geared towards music and what you're going to want to put online. And then you can customize them and then add all of the Banzoogle tools like their, you know, merch sales, music sales, all of that's commission free. It's just part of what you what you get with Banzoogle. They have crowdfunding commission free fan subscription features, mailing list tools so that you can grow your fan list and send newsletters all the social media integrations that you need and live support from their musician friendly team seven days a week. In fact, I think that's where the house rockers is, is hosted. And I think you've got another website that you're going to be sharing soon. That's on, uh, on Banzoogle too. Right, Paul? That's right. I yep. mean, I enjoy, I enjoy being a Banzoogle customer so much. I'm actually going to use our discount code and set up one for my personal, my solo stuff and my other. So my followers will have one single place where they can find my whole schedule I think the most important thing you said was, is you want to have your control of your own site. I mean, yeah. as a longtime Facebook user, and again, Facebook is in flux in many ways now. Um, it's, it's just better. I mean, they yeah, you want to control you, your own destiny for sure. And they charge you, you know, to have access to your own fans, you know, uh, not Banzoogle. No, 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 no. Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, getting the look and feel, it's exactly what you want. And again, my, my site's going to be pretty easy. It's, you know, some pictures of me, a, a show listing, a video of me, and how to get a hold of me. That's, that's really a lot. I, I, don't, I don't know for the type of things that I do that I, I don't need to have a blog or I don't need to do anything yeah. like that. A very simple, essentially an electronic press kit for people to just kind of get in and figure well, out that, who I and am. And that's, that's the beauty of Banzoogle is you can, you can customize it to fit what you want to deliver to your fans and future fans. And like Paul said, because you're a gig gab listener, you can go to banzoogle.com. First, you get to try it free for 30 days. And then you use our promo code gig gab, all one word G I G G A B to get 15% off 
the first year of any subscription there. So banzoogle.com, promo code GIGGAB, and our thanks to Banzoogle for sponsoring this episode. Um, so I talked last week, Paul, about how we talked about warm-up routines, but I also talked about how they are as much a warm-up as a litmus test to let me know how my hands and head and, you know, feet and legs and all that are working on that particular day. It lets me know what to expect when I go to lean on them, perhaps during a gig, right? Well, yep. um, the litmus test this weekend was interesting. We had, we, our gig was supposed to be Friday. I think I mentioned last week that we had a big snowstorm coming. And so we, we wound up midweek, we wound up rescheduling to Sunday uh, afternoon and the gig happened. The snow sort of happened on Friday. It wasn't exactly snow. I think it started with rain and then the temperature just kept dropping. So we had snow for a little bit and then for the bulk of it, it was just spitting ice. I wouldn't even call it sleet. It was literally just ice falling from the sky. And then when all of that was said and done, we got like a dusting of like very fine, you know, snow. It was almost like sugar. You know, it was just this granular thing. What we wound up with, especially after the plow uh, was through sort of plowing the bulk of our driveway, was literally ice mountains uh, anywhere that the, the plow had not moved things. And so Saturday morning when we went out to, you know, clear, just like the plow can't get right up to like where our garages are and things like that. So we always have to like shovel that out or if it's, a, you know, a lot of snow, we'll use the snowblower. So on Saturday morning, I go out and we both went out, my wife and I, and we, I tried the shovel and it was like, there was this ice mountain that sort of was half blocking where my car would come out of the garage and I, I could not safely have driven the car out with this ice mountain because the car probably would have gone like half of it would have gone up on the ice mountain and slid down and, you know, smashed the car into the garage. That would be bad. Right. So got to get rid of the ice mountain. So I try with a shovel and like it, it was like hitting stone. There was just nothing like, OK, cool. So I weasel the snowblower out of the garage and I try the snowblower and it was also like hitting stone with the snowblower. It was like going nowhere. I'm like, well, crap, what am I going to do? And so I started looking at all of my implements of, of, you know, yard destruction. And I found my uh, splitting uh, a, a, a mall. And for those of you that don't split wood, uh, what a mall is, is it's a sledgehammer. But one end of the, the sledge part of it has been filed into like a triangle. I won't say that it's sharp because it's not sharp, but it's into a triangle. And the idea is you you swing this from down over your head. You let the gravity hit the, the top of a piece of wood and it splits the wood apart. And it works very, very well. So I'm like, well, let me try this because it's got a little bit of weight to it. It's got a little bit of a, you know, edge ish kind of thing. And it worked perfectly. This story's going somewhere. It's related to the gig, I promise. And so, OK, great. So now I like hacking at this piece of ice and and, you know, as I would you know, break enough of it up, then I would use the, I wound up using the snowblower to like, you know, move, relocate the crumbs of this thing. But the problem was that, you know, when you're using a, a mall for its intended purpose, you're maybe swinging that thing, let's say five times a minute, right? You know, you set up the log, you swing a couple times and, and then the wood has split. And so you got to move it around and, and it's fine. I was probably swinging that thing 25 times a minute. And it didn't take very long for me to get fatigued to the point where I couldn't even aim the thing straight anymore. Like, it, you know, because it's just like it's heavy and you're moving this thing. And I wasn't swinging it over my head. I was just like lifting it up and down and up and down, banging on this stuff. I'm like, man, this is going to hurt tomorrow. Well, Sunday. So we got that out of the way and I could get my car out, which was important for the gig, you know, for obvious reasons. <laughs> Sunday gig day. I pack up my car and then I come up to the studio and my hands are hurting. My shoulders are hurting, you know, from this whole thing. And, uh, I come up to the studio and, uh, to play, you know, to do my little warm up litmus test thing. I had trouble holding sticks, like for whatever reason, probably because I was using the same muscles to, to hold this mall, you know, that fulcrum that I get between my index finger and my thumb, that's, that's where the stick is held, right? You see a drummer wrap their, their fingers around it, but, that's just for control. Like the stick is held in that fulcrum there. And I, I couldn't hold sticks all that well. And it was like, oh crap. Like I got to go play a two hour gig in three hours or two hours or whatever it is. And so I was like, okay. So took a bunch of Advil, Advil. I ate a bunch of CBD, which helps with like inflammation and stuff. And I got through the gig. It was fine. Um, loading the gear in and out was mildly painful, but fine. 
playing. There were there were two moments in the gig where like I I dropped a stick or lost a lost hold of things in a controllable way. And I was like, oh crap, man. Like it sucks. But it, you know, I had to be very cautious throughout the gig to like not overdo it because I I re like th of all the things I've ever done, this is second only to when my wrist was in a cast in terms of things that I've done that Im like I do things all the time. I'll get like cuts on my hand or, you know, a bruise or something. And it's like, can I hold the drumstick? Can I still play? Yes. No, like it's never a problem. Yesterday it was a major problem. Um, yeah. It was like, it was one of those things like, yeah, you got to take care of yourself a little bit here. Definitely. Yeah. It was, um, but it, you know, I mean, we made it through the gig. It was fine. I don't. I, I didn't say anything to my bandmates because I I didn't want to be the one showing up and like sandbagging or anything. Like it's you're either there to do the gig or you say you can't. It's one or the other. It's a binary, right. you know. But um, and I also didn't want to give myself any excuses. It was like, okay, well, you got to figure out how to get through this, man. But it was, it was an ordeal. Um, just making sure that the stick stayed in my hands. <laughs> I learned. It. Next Go ahead. How did you feel the next day? Well, today is the next day. Uh, I'm still sore. I still like, I can't like holding a, a tea mug or, you know, a coffee mug or whatever, like, which you also use that same fulcrum for, although a, a much wider one than you would a drumstick. Like, I, like even that is, is, has been difficult, you know, the last couple of days. It's, it's definitely, I did bad things to myself. It'll be fine. I I, what's that? I did bad things. I did bad things to myself. Yeah, for sure. I also learned something at this gig, Paul. We, um, and I, 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 I suppose, yeah, I did notice it at the last one we did the flight coffee gig. And then, um, this one yesterday, the, the band has, we, we as a band and I, and I, I, I mean this with ownership by all of us very much, including me. Um, but as a band, we have gotten out of practice at playing indoor gigs this is a definitely a byproduct of COVID, right? Most of the gigs we played all summer were outdoor gigs. And sound and blend are very different and far more forgiving when you are outside versus when you are inside. And, right. you know, and Bitter, Bitter Pill has always been great at like stage volume and blend and all of those things that come together to make the band sound good. And, and certainly our priorities have not changed, right? Like we, we all are still very much on board with that, but we are also as a band out of practice at making that blend happen. And I, you know, like, like the, the gig we did a couple of weeks ago, I, I noticed it, but it was like, also, you know, we're in a room and there's brick and hardwood and, and glass. And it's like, this is an unforgiving environment. And it was fine. Like the crowd at both gigs was loved it. Like it was fine. But, you know, you notice things on stage. It's like, oh, yeah, we don't like we're not sounding like great to, to me, you know. And then the same thing was true yesterday. It was like, yeah, we're just like we're having volume wars and, and things that that just we have not traditionally had in this band. And it, I, you know, it's a I mean, I and I share it because my guess is. We are all going to many of us. I'm not all of us, you know, but many of us are likely to fall into this same, uh, you know, the same sort of trap, the same sort of scenario. And so I share it, you know, just to have everybody shine a light on it with your own bands that if you've been playing in, you know, in forgiving environments, a.k.a. outdoor stages for most of your gigs, just be aware the next time you go into the you know, play an indoor gig that you gotta, you know, all those things that, you know, that, that have stopped being habit, you need to make habit again. And that's really what it is. You know, it's just like, it wasn't, it was, it was a great gig. I was going to say it wasn't a bad gig, but which is true, but it was a, it was a great gig the band played well. And again, yeah. we entertained people who are, you know, people were into it the whole time. It wasn't like we cleared the room or, you know, it wasn't like, in fact, quite the opposite, but it was like, yeah, we are, we are, Capable of being better at making ourselves sound good than this, you know, and it happens. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. You know, it's how it is. Uh, so I don't know. You know, I don't know that I, I, other than being aware of it, I don't know that I have any specific advice to share. Although I'm sure as 
things progress with bitter pill and we reacclimate ourselves to this, I will have some little nuggets of like, oh, think about this, do that. I mean, uh, my, my, and I'll share those, but my general advice always is get to the club, turn on, you know, get your, your instrument in position because where your amp or your instrument is matters in terms of how it's going to reflect off of everything in the club and then play it and listen and listen for how it sounds in the room Listen for, you know, is this the right guitar, amp, cymbal, snare drum to use in this environment? Or, you know, do I need to roll off some low end? Do I need to add some high end? Like what, what is, what is it about this room that I need to compensate for to make sure. it sound like me? Right. Cause it, you know, that's, that's the key. I think. I think it's that whole thing about a, when it's a new band or B when it's a, a band that hasn't seen each other for a while do you have those habits, that, that, that routine of easing? Because it's more than just a line check or, or a sound check, right? No, it's, it's more, yeah, it's listening to how do you and how does the band sound in the room. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And also, not just technically, like, like an EQ standpoint, but are you in blend in a way that you can perform, right? I, I remember what, there was some pro sound engineer on, on some documentary, and they were asking, is it loud on stage? And, and the guy said, you know what? Uh, these guys mix themselves, right? You know, that they they yep. basically, yep. you know, know that what they need in order to have a blend, they can comfortably deliver their art. So yes. I think that's a good thing. It is. Yeah, it is for sure. Hey, so this gig yesterday, though, was the first time that I got to use the new Mackie DL32S, that uh, the mixer, right, that, uh, that I got, well, during COVID, and so didn't really have the opportunity to play any yeah. gigs with it. Yeah, this is so I've been using the the Mackie DL sixteen oh eight with um you know with all the bands for years. That was the original Mackie iPad controlled you know Wi Fi capable mixer that they came out with and started that whole product line for them. And I think was really one of the first consumer focused ones to do that, or you know prosumer if you want to if you want to call it that. And uh, so I couldn't migrate everything over with one flip of a switch. However, I, the same software is used for both. So I was able to take like each channel and bring it over. So the gain structure of each channel was able to come over. And that actually made life super easy because I, you know, I know that, OK, you know, Billy on that microphone needs to have the gain set here. And this is how we set the EQ and the compression. And, you know, all of that stuff was able to come over and, and worked out great. So thank goodness for that. And, I, and then I just assigned it to, you know, all the channels. But it, it's nice having the flexibility of channels. This is a 32-channel mixer. We only use 12, okay? But what's what I found really nice is it's got, this is, you know, 32, and they've broken it into eight uh, or group, four groups of eight and so I was like, oh, well, why don't we use the first group for vocals and the second group for drums and the third group for instruments and the fourth group for whatever else might come up, you know? So we've got extra room. We, we generally, this band has sort of pared down to having only three live vocal mics on stage. But if we ever do a larger gig where we need more, you know, Tomer will do some uh, like Shakespeare reading sometimes to start a set or even in the middle of a set. And so if we need a, you know, a mic for Tomer, okay, we've got room for that. It can just go right there in with the rest of the vocal mics and all of that's good. But um, it migrated over great. It, it worked well. It's so much smaller than the other one because I don't have to fit an iPad into it anymore. They figured mm -hmm. out that nobody wants that. It's just stage box size is what it is and sort of all self-contained and, uh, and all of that. So I was pretty stoked, it, you know, to be able to, I, I mean, I spent a couple hours on, on Saturday just migrating everything over and making sure and tweaking and, you know, testing and making sure like sound comes out like, yes, okay, that's good. Is the gain where I thought it was? Yes. You know, because this one has digital gains, which is a huge upgrade from the old one, which had everything was digital except the gains. So if you needed to adjust gains, you literally had to go to the mixer and turn a, you know, a, a potentiometer to do that. Now it's all just set digitally. And so there's no... You know, I don't have to like tweak that at every gig. It's just like, well, yep. if I pull up, if I pull up this band's show, then all the gains are where they're supposed to be. Obviously, if somebody's too hot on stage with an instrument input, we we have to adjust. But you know, at least we're starting from a spot where it's pretty easy. So it was good. I don't know. Sounds good. Yeah, I like it. The um, the Wi-Fi portion of this is interesting, uh, and I have a tip 
for my nerdy or non-nerdy friends out there that use Wi-Fi mixers. This mixer, everybody, when I got this thing, and I think I even mentioned it on the show, Paul, but when I got this thing, the all the feedback I saw online was, yeah, great mixer, do not trust the Wi-Fi. <laughs> like, oh, okay. And it's only single band Wi-Fi. It uses 2.4 gigahertz, which is like, okay, like it really shouldn't, but okay, fine. Um 2.4 is a pretty congested area of the uh, FAA airwaves, uh, if you will. Lots of things live there, including most other Wi-Fi networks. But it's it's not it's not a wide enough band to house all of the things that need to live there, and so it gets super congested. And if you've had Wi-Fi issues in like your apartment, especially you know if you've got other people living around you, that's usually where they come from is that 2.4 gigahertz band. And so people say that they would get to a gig and like not be able to connect to their mixer because there was just too much Wi-Fi congestion. That's bad, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they said use an external mixer. But I didn't want to get myself into a scenario where I had to, before the gig, choose never to use the Wi-Fi in the mixer. I want to be able to have a safety plan where if the mixer's Wi-Fi is not enough for a given room that I have this extra bit, but otherwise I I don't want to, you know, I, I want to, I want to be able to just use it because it's way simpler because it's literally built in. Like that's the whole convenience part of it. You just turn it on and go. So I started digging into how this could work and I came up with the answer. And the answer is to use a Wi-Fi extender with an asterisk or a router, which I suppose would have the same asterisk, they both would need to have Ethernet ports. And the reason is I tried using a Wi-Fi extender that just grabs a Wi-Fi signal and echoes it. As soon as I did that, the mixer stopped responding. It does not like seeing another Wi-Fi network with the same name. So uh, Ethernet has to be involved because you've got to be able to connect uh, to your extender or router or whatever it's going to be with an Ethernet cable. I chose to do it with a router simply because I'm a nerd and I'm a router nerd and I have lots of routers spare sitting around. So, I, you know, I, that's the way I would go with it um, or that's the way I went with it. But I think I could probably do it less expensively with a Wi-Fi extender. Uh, the router I have effectively made into an extender by putting it in what's called bridge mode, which turns off all of its ability to be a router. It just becomes a Wi-Fi access point, essentially. Which is, a cent which is what your range extenders do, too. The trick is, as we learned from lesson number one here, where we needed an Ethernet cable, is that the name of the network that is uh, being created by the extender slash router needs to be different than your mixer. This is very different than what you would typically want in your home, where you want the same network name for everything because you just want your devices to roam seamlessly and be wonderful. Obviously, that doesn't work here. I don't know why, but be that as it may, it doesn't. I tested it. I drove myself crazy with it, folks. Don't drive yourselves crazy. Create a network name that's different. And and so you'll see two networks show up in your, um, you know, in your list. One will be the one that is the mixer. One will be the one that is your extender. And I tested it all out and it, and it works great. And the nice part about this is I have ultimate flexibility because I can get to a gig. I can plug the the mixer and get it all set up and then decide is the Wi-Fi in the room such that the mixer is going to work on its own? And if it is, then I don't have to plug in more stuff. If it's not, then all I do is add the router, Ethernet cable, power cable done, and now I have my much stronger 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi network ready to roll. So that's my advice for all of you. If you have any questions, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. So. There was one other thing. I mentioned that we had a... Um, uh, a tip or a, an engine to share a piece of software to share. And it's called where's the gig. And it's at where's the gig.com. We got an email from Ethan who was referred to us by longtime listener, Andy. Uh, Ethan has built this engine. He's the one that created this. Where's the gig. And this is for managing your band internally. It does all kinds of things like creating your calendar, including letting your bandmates log in and mark their availability and unavailability inside the engine so that when it comes time to book a gig, you can look and say, oh, yeah, OK, this is great. And here it is. And uh, and instead of, you know, whatever, the text trail or the Facebook group trail or the Slack trail or whatever it is that, you know, we all have to go through it. We sure everybody's available. Everything good. Can we do this? Yada, yada, yada. You know, we can just check things off or uncheck things and boom. 
you know what dates are free, what dates are not, um, all of that stuff. It also has a set list. Well, when you put a gig in, it you can put all kinds of detail in, like load in times, contact, you know, obviously where it is and the address and, you know, all the stuff that you would need to know for the gig. What kind of gig is it? Is it a club gig? Is it a wedding? You know, what is it time in the studio? It has a set list feature, Paul, where you put all your songs in and then you can order a set list by dragging around and moving things. You even put times like average time of each song on. So, you know, OK, yeah, this set's going to be 45 minutes. This set's going to be an hour and 10, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and then you can see the calendar and you can subscribe to it, integrate it with your own stuff. So the gigs just appear. Uh, I, it looks pretty cool, man. It's, it's done a really good job. I mean, it, just this whole concept of managing availability is really, that's the core thing that it does. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can get a schedule posted, that type of thing. But the, the time consuming, frustrating thing, especially as your band gets bigger, but not only for bigger bands is just if you're available and then just how smart it is that it kind of simplifies the process of going out to your sub pool and saying, you know, something's coming up, who's available. And, and that makes that a little bit more seamless. So, so really smart. I mean, talk about like, like, by musicians for, for musicians in yeah. the same way that band Zoogle is really good for your kind of outward facing thing. This takes care of one of your more complicated things internally, internally. Yeah. And, and you, we, we've actually recorded this segment twice uh, as we have about half the show because uh, there was another break that we didn't alert you to that. We didn't uh, record. We didn't click record when, uh, when we came back from it, but y you, you alluded to something that we had not told them about. So this is a free engine and it is free for the first six months. A hundred percent of the features are free for the first six months. And that's so that bands can get used to using that. Where's the gig and, you know, figure out what features you need. And then at about the six month mark, that's when, you know, uh, Ethan is asking you to start covering, you know, some of his costs and, and wow. development time and all that stuff. But, uh, the features are, uh, and, and pricing, just so you know, member that whole member availability feature, that's five bucks a month. That's not five bucks per member. That's five bucks for the band. Right. So, you know, that's pretty reasonable. And then, uh, you alluded to using subs or, or hired gun scenarios. He says they have a confirmation response system. It's 12 bucks a month and it's for bands that, that use hired guns. Uh, where and where's the gig will send out who's available on this date emails and track responses automatically. So you, if you're the one coordinating things, can know, ah, okay, well, I can pick from these three guitar players. I've only got this one drummer, so I guess we have to take Dave for the gig, you know, those kinds of things. <laughs> I assume that's what people say. Uh, but this will let you, you know, kind of see that and and uh, and pull all that together. And then for 15 bucks a month, there's a multiple account service, and that's for... Um, band leaders or musicians who are involved in multiple different projects that where's the gig uses, this will link them all together so that you, you can, I'm, I'm guessing quickly cross pollinate your calendars so that, you know, if one band's gig, the gigging one, the other band is busy, you know, or you, if you're gigging with one band, you're, you're busy with another. And, um, I think it's, yeah, it like clearly built, like you said by musicians for musicians. I, I mean, like. Very obviously so with this too, right? Uh, yeah. What's well, such a nuanced problem that, you know, <laughs> yeah. that we keep using generic tools to try and and, uh, and work through? But here, this is, this is pretty cool. Yeah, I, I am hoping that um, at least some of my bands that I play in start using this because, I, like, it seems like it would remove so much headache. So, yep, that's where we go. Anything else today? My friend, no, we kind of bounce. We kind of bounce through this episode, Dave. I don't. I don't think in the seven years we've been doing this, we've ever had a weirder episode with starts and stops and forgetting <laughs> to press record and stuff like that. So, well, I gotta apologies look cause... if it comes across weird to the listening audience out there. Yeah, for but, sure. But uh, you, you know, we gave you our best today. We did. We did. It's weird because I have like, you know, me. I'm all about efficiency and removing the opportunity for human error. And I have it so that I can, if we need to pause, I hit a button on my keyboard and it, it pauses things. And then I have another button that I hit that resumes and it keeps the clock. I keep, uh, you know, we put chapters in every episode um, for like the different topics that we hit. And I like to do those for you so that if you want to skip around or whatever, if you're talking about something that doesn't pertain to you, just skip over it. You know, it's fine. And uh it, like I had this, I have this system that I built with a bunch of scripts and stuff that you don't care about, but it's supposed to work and it has worked. 
And the, the pause part works. The resume part starts the clock ticking again. But evidently, as I've proven twice today, it does not resume the recording. Now, the second time I knew it wasn't going to happen, so I resumed the recording manually. But the first time we got through three more segments until I realized, hey, Paul, crap. <laughs> and add in the complications that a bio break in, implies and, you know, you, you've got madness. It's madness, my friend. <laughs> madness. Thanks for bearing with us on this one. If you had to bear with us, maybe it comes across smooth and you didn't know. If that's the case, then we did Ignore our- Ignore the last 30 seconds. <laughs> that's right. It's nothing to see here behind the curtain. All right. Well, that's what I got for today. Anything else for you, man? I'm good, my brother. Okay. Well, let me see if I can find the- where I where I play the music and we actually hear the music, so that would be a, a big good red thing. button. Oh, okay. Well, I don't think it's working, but you know, I'll try it and we'll see what happens. Is that the music? Hey, there yeah. it is. I found the music. <laughs> Always be performing, Dave. Always be performing, no matter what, even if you can't hold the drumsticks, I suppose. So, yeah, this was the can't hold the drumstick episode for sure. <sighs> Have a good one, folks. We'll see you next week. See you, Dave. See ya.